Well, hello there, all you magnificent people, and welcome back to An Ecologist Plays, a channel where I get to ramble about nature while playing games. And I'm back in this amazing game, Terra Null, a game where you are restoring a very much degraded Earth and trying to get it back to its former glory. Now, uh, having said that, I'm actually not restoring it, I'm rehabilitating it, because I'm not taking it back to exactly the same way it was, I'm just getting it to a functional state, and that is the, partly the difference between restoration and rehabilitation. Rehabilitating it is getting it back to a functional state, and restoring it is getting it back to the same state it was in. Anyway, so... With that being said, let's jump right back in. And we have enough of the mangrove forests and enough of the sandy shores or sandy beaches all along our little island here. We have to now get the tropical rainforest back in the central part here. And at the same time also put in some coral reefs along the outside of this island. So, let's first get the thunderstorms to begin. And we're going to get that to start by getting the temperatures up to more than 35 degrees and there are two ways i believe that one can do that you can and we're going to start with that you can use your combustor over here to burn large parts of the vegetation here and when you do that it is going to of course degrade this area but it is also going to take the temperature up a little bit I need to get it up by three more degrees and I think the only places we can really burn would be the beaches over here. I don't really want to burn the beach. I didn't know a beach could burn, but anyway. And we are going to burn this section over here and that will let us get the thunderstorms to begin. So, unfortunately for the greater good, we had to destroy some sandy beaches and now it is back up to us to again bring in those sandy beaches in a moment. But first... The thunder is rolling in. Now with the heat, of course, a lot of evaporation will take place from the ocean. So that's going to at least cause a high humidity in the air here, and even higher humidity, giving us rain. And uh, as it rains, of course, the pollutants over here get removed. Technically, the pollutants of, on land here would wash into the ocean. But anyway, we're not going to nitpick that. But as this is happening, we've got the degraded areas and the burnt areas becoming grassy meadows. And once this thunderstorm is done, we are going to get to the forest restoration. Okay, the rain has now passed, and now it is time for us to use the other method I believe one can use to raise the temperatures, and that is to actually establish forests. So we're going to do that by creating shade cloth areas, and once you have three connected, you have a little patch of forest growing there. And that is... Oh, I love it. I love the fact that you can put in forests like this. Now, they all link up with one another, and we are just increasing the area that we've got a little forest patch here. The majority of this central plateau will now become forest, at least in this map of mine. And there we go. We have raised the temperature by one degree by putting in the tropical forests over here. Now the idea here is that we want to create a suitable environment for the little seedlings of the tropical forest trees to actually establish. And a lot of these are used to growing under the shade of a lot of other trees. So that's the difference between the pine forests we had earlier in the game, or in the three episodes ago, and the tropical forests here. The pine forests very often need fire in order to actually... Uh, remove a lot of the undergrowth and a lot of the canopy so that the little seedlings have enough sunlight to germinate. Not so in the tropical rainforest. In tropical rainforests, fire is really rare. And so it's mostly a case of we are trying to establish under the canopy of, you know, all the adult trees in the area. And that is why with these forests we are creating shade cloth. They are used to establishing under the canopy of trees and we want to provide them with the best possible chance to survive. In tropical rainforests like these, highly highly productive systems, lots and lots of biomass, in some cases very high biodiversity as well, so lots of different species and a lot of animals as well because there's such a range of strata present here. So in other words vegetation layers, you've got the shrub layer here, you've got some normal canopy trees here, you'll have some subdominant trees there, different layer underneath. You may even have some big trees growing out over 
the normal canopy, the emergence. We've got so many different layers present in the rainforest. Well-developed rainforests are like onions and ogres. They've got layers. And in this case, the layers here will mean that it's extremely diverse in animal species because they've got so many different niches available to fill, different roles, different things they can do in the environment. And you know what? I think we have now accomplished all of our goals. We no longer have the moss on rock faces or can't get it to develop, but we still have them present. The ones that established there previously, when temperatures were still under 10 degrees, well, they are still there. Uh, but we can't get any more establishing now. Anyway, we now have three of our four vegetation types or biomes present. We just need the coral reefs. And in order to do that, we first need to get the monorail system going here. And we are just going to use it to move something somewhere else. So we just placed a nice little irrigator over there and we're just going to take it and move it a little bit closer. There we go, we're just going to put it right over there. And now we have done that and we have unlocked the coral lab which is marvelous. The coral lab, as it says, they will grow coral from polyps. Now, polyps are little anemone-like parts, basically little individual corals. And those polyps can replicate and form new individuals, basically just grow the coral in size. So you just need one little polyp and you can form a whole new brain coral, for example, or staghorn coral or something along those lines. So you can grow a lot of coral from a lot of little polyps. And we're going to put that right over there so now technically this little lab is now able to be placed unfortunately it's not in range there so what we're going to do is going to mineralize this area and we are going to hopefully yeah there we go we can move this little guy into the ocean we take it and now when it opens up we should be able to get a lot of different coral. And there we go. We've got our first little coral reef. Oh, and isn't that just marvelous? Okay, let's continue doing that. There we go. There's a second one being opened up. And voila. Nice coral reef establishes here. Ah, marvelous. So many different fish species in here as well. Now, the thing is, you can't just grow the coral. You need to grow the coral and the zooxanthellae, the little algae that live within them, because the algae and the coral will have an amazing symbiotic relationship. And without the one, the other can't survive. And we are just going to put in a lot of coral reefs all along on this side of the island. And then perhaps in this quiet bay over here as well. And I think by putting it in here, we are going to reach our quota. And voila. Now we need to use the monorails to remove all of our things around here. The problem is that we don't have a lot of uh, rocks to put the monorails on. But we're going to try and see what we can do in any way. Of course, we are also placing an animal observatory because we do need to look for a whole bunch of animals and this one is a beach dwelling reptile that lives on an island where it can retreat into its shell here we are looking at some kind of tortoise or so and let's have a look i think there is an island over here so we may be able to find them here there we go there are some tortoises and these are most likely either the aldabra giant tortoise or the galapagos giant tortoise so a tortoise of course because it can retreat into its shell it can pull its head back into its shell or most species at least can uh, at least partly uh, and they put it in directly back not sideways as in how terrapins would do it what i can tell you are that tortoises and terrapins and turtles their shells are not a loose part of their body their shells are actually scales that are placed over their ribs and their ribs are weird and on the inside if you look if you would ever find a skeleton of a tortoise you'll find that the shell has got a whole bunch of vertebral vertebrae fused to it and the ribs are actually fused to the inside of the shell as well and because it's part of their body and because they've got a lot of nerve endings and so as well going into their shell they can feel when you touch them and that's why i get really frustrated when people knock on a tortoise's shell or anything like that because they can feel pain and 
they can feel it. It's like someone walking up to a random person and knocking them on the head going, hello, is there anybody in there? Basically the same thing. Uh, it would frustrate me just as much. So please, people, if you do see a tortoise, please don't knock it on the shell. They really, really don't like that. Uh, stroking it may be a different story, especially if they are used to it. Uh, then that may actually be a different story. But yeah, please don't poke them on the shell. Uh, we're just putting a whole bunch of tortoises on the different islands that we have got available. Uh, I suspect it's living on an island because it is referring to the Aldabra and Galapagos giant tortoises. Tortoises which are confined to island ecosystems. I had talked about that a little bit more in my One Planet Zoo episode. and I'll link that up at the top there. Uh, for now though, we are going to be looking at this unusually shaped creature that lies in the ocean near river estuaries and coral reefs. Now we need to fi first find a river estuary. Uh, I think we've got that over here. And there we go, we have got all three things perfect for them. Now we just need to find where on earth they are. And there we go. I think there's one right over there. There it is indeed. I believe they're also called Devil Rays. Um, I don't know. They're such cute and gentle giants. Uh, some of the largest ray species, I believe. Or if not the largest ray species. Manta Rays. Filt oh, there we go. It just leapt out of the water. Oh, goodness. I didn't even know they had this behavior in here. Uh, but sometimes I know they will leap out. I'm not sure whether it's sometimes for no apparent reason. But I think it's also for courtship. Oh, they are such magnificent creatures. They are filter feeders. Uh, kind of using those two little weird things in the front of their mouths over there to guide water into their mouths so that they can filter feed. But there's a small one and there's a big one right over there. They can get really massive in size. I think about a three meter wingspan for these mantas as well. Not dangerous to humans unless you really threaten them and they fall on you. But that's not really a risk in the ocean, I guess. Oh, they're such cute 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 creatures of course we have also found nemo the clownfish are also swimming around here they are of course in the coral reef because we will have things like anemones in this coral reef as well anemones and corals are actually very closely related along with jellyfish and blue bottles and those types of things and we actually have jellyfish there we go it's floating around right over there there are jellyfish back in the oceans over here as well there we go there's a jellyfish as well uh, they all belong to the Nigeria, which all have stinging cells. So those are creatures with stinging cells. And ah, it is gorgeous to see the coral reefs come back to life. Now, what we need to get next for this one, the colorful bird that makes its home in lush forest canopies beneath clear skies. We need it so that there are no human structures present. I don't think we've got any of that. No, we have got a toxin scrubber over there. I think for the majority of this forest, we will always have something in the area. So we're going to look for this one once we have removed the shade cloth, the poles, the buildings, all those types of things. In the meantime, we can look for this little guy, a wader that combs for food among the sands of beaches and the muds of estuaries. So we are going to look for them, I think, here. We don't have enough beach. Okay, okay, we can look for that here. And we have found them. We found flamingos. Ah, oh, gorgeous. This looks like the Andean uh, flamingo, if I'm not mistaken. I'll have to double check. Uh, very, very pink, dark bull. I think that's the Andean flamingo. But they, of course, get the pink color from the beta carotene in their food. The pigments in the little crustaceans that they eat. Oh, gorgeous. Look at them fly. Beautiful pink color. Of course, the more beta carotene they get in, the pinker they will be in color. And if they don't actually get any carotene in, any beta carotene, they will revert back to the natural color, which is white, which is weird. It won't harm them as far as I know. They may not be able to attract mates, but they will be alive at least. Um, but yeah, they will not be pink if they don't get beta carotene in. Oh, that is such a cute, beautiful bird. We can also look for them right over here. There we go. We've got flamingos wading in the shallow waters. Of course, they will be wading around and then they will be lowering their beaks into the water to actually feed because they feed by actually moving their tongue to pump water in and out of their beaks and in the process they filter it out very much like baleen whales those whales that are filter feeders that will also filter out krill and things like that with their little baleen plates they also have a filter like structure in their mouths here the flamingos which is 
quite amazing to watch. I have also seen flamingos swim, believe it or not, and filtering food while they are swimming, uh, which was extraordinary to watch. They submerged their bodies completely. They looked like little ducks swimming around in the water. And uh, it was quite interesting to see that. Now the next animal, I think maybe a little bit difficult to get, but we're going to, but we're going to try and get it in any case. An aquatic predator that lives in both dense coral and the water of mangrove forests. Hmm. So let's have a look and see. I think I know what this one would be, but let's have a look and see if we've got it. We have everything correct. We also need a temperature of more than 20 degrees. And look at that. We have reef sharks. So the reef sharks uh, looks like a black tip reef shark because it has got black tips on its uh, tail, uh, tail fin and its caudal fin over there, the fin on its back. I think that's the black tip reef shark. They can move into the mangroves because the mangroves are also growing in salty or saline water. If it were a Zambezi shark or a bull shark, it would actually have been able to travel all the way up into the fresh water in the rivers, uh, up until the point where there are waterfalls, they would be able to travel. But in this case, they are saltwater species, they are reef sharks. And oh, goodness gracious, I love these guys. We'd love to still see one one day. Maybe someday I'll get lucky. We're just putting in a lot of different sharks. They very often hunt very much in big groups, especially at night. They tend to go into feeding frenzies when they manage to uh, find some uh, food, some fish swimming around, and then they just go crazy uh, hunting them down. Yeah, that was cool. Let's have a look. I think we may be able to bring in some here as well. There we go. Okay, managed to get some in here as well. And that brings us to the last species we can get before we remove everything. And that's a large pelagic, pelagic meaning open ocean. So a pelagic mammal swimming in the deep waters of the ocean far from land. And that should be right over there. It's deep water. It's no land in range. Okay, I need to just put it completely to the back here. And there we go. We ha should have some whales popping up in a moment. This slow moving species, I'm sure it takes them a while to get here. But we're going to put a whole bunch of whales in at the back here as well. Now, unfortunately, I can't yet see our whales. I'm not sure where they are. They're somewhere, I guess. But they're not swimming around in the spots where we have placed them. They may be a little bit slow moving, so they may take a while to get here, I guess. <laughs> they may be migrating. A lot of whale species are migratory. In South Africa, for example, we've got the southern right whales, which will be migrating in, and they're currently here on our shore. And then when it gets uh, into summer for us, they head down into the Antarctic Oceans, and they will be feeding on krill over there. While they are here in South Africa, apparently they don't eat at all, which is astonishing. But anyway, uh, I don't think we're going to see them pop up, which means... It's time for us to start recycling everything. So let's get right down to it. We're going to start by just removing everything. And then we will figure out how to get everything out of here. <laughs> that is going to be a challenge all on its own. Okay, I think I have removed almost everything now. It's just a case of placing down our little ship here. And where is a good spot to land? That's the problem. Okay, I'm going to land here. I think this will have the least impact. I don't want to land in forest. Oh, I don't think I could land in forest in any case. I didn't want to land in the middle of a swamp or the mangroves or anything. But yeah, on the beach, I guess that's where we're going to land. And now we need to also create a whole bunch of little monorail nodes still. We need to set up a network along here. Okay, so now we'll be able to place the recycler station. So that will go right over here. And now the problem is that we need to have a monorail node basically everywhere. And the way one can do that is, of course, by building little mineralizers here and then placing on the rock there, placing a little um, monorail node. And now we should be able to access this entire area. And when you are ready, you'll just place a little recycling beacon on here and voila, it's going to go onto it and remove everything in range. And voila. So now that node will disappear. And everything around it is also gone. Let's start on this side. Quickly start doing that. Now while a few things are being removed here. We have also unlocked the rock hopper. Which we can use to actually 
get some rocks to other areas. There we go, we have created a nice little network over here now and are able to just go, okay, I want to remove this and then I want to remove that node as well. A little recycling drone is going to make its way around here to come and get it. And at this point the game does become a puzzle where you've got to figure out how on earth are you going to go about removing all signs that you were actually in this area. And uh, yeah, if you manage to get it right, that is actually quite a lot of fun. Uh, let's continue. We're actually making good progress here. Soon there will be no sign that we were on this tropical paradise island. I must say, I really appreciate the fact that they want you to, in the end, leave no sign that you were here. A lot of restoration and rehabilitation projects unfortunately can't do that. You do need to pick up some more permanent structures, at least for the first few years, to actually catch uh, sand and uh, seeds and those types of things. You need to dig hollows. Eventually those hollows will fill up with silt, but for the first few years they will be there and they will be kind of the scar on the landscape. In some cases you need to put up fences to actually catch uh, debris floating uh, down the uh, landscape, moving down the landscape. In some cases you need to put down biojute, which eventually will degrade, yes. But for the first few years, again, it will be present in the landscape. So, yeah, the fact that you've got to eventually have the self-sustaining ecosystem is really quite cool. Now, in successional ecology, we often talk of a climax community, which is a community that is able to maintain itself. Uh, and maintain itself as the way it is. And in this case, the rainforest here, the tropical forest, a typical example of a self-sustaining climax community where the vegetation here will remain as productive and with as many species over time. If you leave it for 200 years, it will still function as a rainforest, a typical climax community. But when you look at that, we are almost done. But before we finish completely, I'm going to put up the animal observatory again we are going to scan for the last species which makes its home in lush forest canopies beneath clear skies and we are going to go for the parrots and there we have we've got i think the scarlet macaw over there and one of the other macaws i don't know blue there's another one over here green blue yellowish reddish very very colorful in rainforests colorful birds like these may actually be very well camouflaged now you would expect in forest lots of green birds like these two macaws flying around and that is what you will find but you can also find very very colorful birds because rainforests are actually surprisingly colorful there are lots and lots of flowers in there and colorful birds like these may actually just be surprisingly well camouflaged we're just going to try and put in another cluster of them there we go now macaws are awesome they will be feeding on a lot of fruits and they also be feeding on some leaves but then they will detoxify themselves. They know that the fruits they eat and the leaves they eat may actually be toxic. So they go to clay pits and they actually eat the clay there. And in doing so, they will then detoxify themselves. The clay then binds the toxins and actually neutralizes it. And I think that is it, everybody. I think, yeah, there we go. We have finally rehabilitated this island. And oh my word, it is just awesome. And that, of course, means it is time for us to go. And we are going to leave this little part of the world behind. And, oh my word, I can't believe this looked the way it did before we started. It is such a different, different environment. And there we go. Wasteland reclaimed. And with that, everybody, it is time to end today's episode. So thank you very much for coming along on this little journey with us. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll be back on Friday again with another uh, episode of The Hunter, Call of the Wild, back in the Emerald Coast in Australia. We'll be looking at some uh, other exotics and potentially some indigenous species in that map. And until then, everybody, stay safe. I'll see you all soon. Bye.